It's a real privilege to be here today and to be invited to talk to you. So we're moving away from talking about drugs now to talk about how we can improve access to psychological therapies in primary care. Uh, each country really needs to work out how to do this for themselves, taking on board their own unique characteristics uh, from how the healthcare sector is funded to the cultural and social settings within which they operate. But at the same time, I think there's a lot we can actually draw on from the experience of other countries. And this is my aim today to share with you some of the experiences from the UK, which has invested a great deal in trying to improve access to psychological therapies for its people. They even have a name for it, IAPT. And I'm going to be talking about that specific project a little bit later. Uh, I've been working as a clinical psychologist here in Abu Dhabi now for over a decade. And I believe I was actually the first British clinical psychologist to ever get a license here. And over that decade, I've seen big changes in the willingness of particularly young Emiratis to seek out and engage in psychological therapy. Stigma is still a significant barrier to service uptake, and we've heard a lot about that earlier this afternoon. Um, despite that, the demand for talking therapies, uh, at least the desire to talk through their problems and develop some ways of coping with them, seems to be steadily increasing. Over that period, we've also seen a significant increase in the number of private sector clinics and in the number of licensed psychologists in Abu Dhabi. Yet despite this growth in services, uh, demand is still outstripping supply. And many clinics now have waiting lists for psychological treatment. So let's think about why the waiting lists are growing. I think over the last few years, we've learned that mental health can really happen to anyone. Mental health problems can happen to anyone. When we're deprived of our normal routines, maybe our jobs are on the line, we find ourselves a long way from our families, we're surrounded perhaps by sickness, even people dying, and we're deprived of our normal coping mechanisms like seeing friends or perhaps taking some exercise, it takes a lot of resilience not to begin to feel anxious or depressed. And the media has joined in endorsing this idea that poor mental health is not just a biomedical problem, it's a biopsychosocial problem. So I want to go over the biopsychosocial model with you uh, before we consider its implications. Now this model proposes that a range of interrelated factors are gonna to combine to cause a mental health condition. These factors are grouped under biological, psychological, and social, and all three can contribute to making an individual vulnerable to developing a mental health problem. Symptoms are triggered by a critical incident or event or a series of events that's interpreted, given meaning by the person, and which may in itself trigger a range of physiological reactions. Now these symptoms may persist and generalize if various factors are in play that stop them naturally resolving as they might otherwise do. What we refer to as maintenance factors. So social factors in themselves have a huge influence on whether mental health issues develop and whether they persist. So social pressures increase, mental health problems increase. In England in 2021, there were one and a half million people waiting for mental health support and 11% of those people ended up in the ER. One way of trying to manage um, KPIs on waiting times has been to provide assessments after which the person may still have to wait a significant amount of time for therapy, with 23% waiting more than three months. And that's sometimes referred to as the hidden waiting list. Over in the US, and maybe my American colleagues will, will correct me on some of my figures, hopefully not, uh, waiting times are far less of a problem than the cost um, of therapy. With the recent survey, showing that 25% of Americans 
report having to choose between receiving mental health care and paying for daily necessities. The same 2018 survey showed a staggering 56% of Americans were either seeking or wanting to seek mental health services for a loved one or themselves. So the demand is growing. Waiting times for mental health services in the UK were even worse back in 2013, when a survey by the mental health charity Mind noted that 54% of referrals were waiting for more than three months for psychological therapy, and 12% for over a year. Feels a bit late then, doesn't it really, of over a year waiting? Back in the 1980s, uh, nothing is new. When I worked in a psychiatric hospital in Scotland, uh, we used to run primary care clinics in the local health centres there. Uh, and the waiting list was enormous even then. Yeah. Demand exceeding supply, I think, has been a long term problem in the UK. So in 2007, there was an extraordinary initiative which sought to transform access to psychological therapies which was called IAPT, stands for Improving Access to Psychological Therapies. By 2018, IAPT was described as the largest publicly funded implementation of evidence-based psychological care in the world. By 2019, between 2008 and 2019, 10 and a half, half thousand workers have been trained. Its costs per patient seem relatively modest. Um, I did the translation, less than three and a half thousand dirhams a head, with about 1.25 million referrals a year being made. It's been used as a model in other countries around the world and led to a complete restructuring of psychological care in the UK at the primary care level and beyond using a step care model and based on the principle that psychological care should be available to everyone that needs it. The IAPT workforce consists of staff who are trained to be what's called either low or high intensity workers. Low intensity workers are also sometimes called psychological wellbeing practitioners or PWPs. Initially, people who were referred by a general practitioner, what we uh, know in the UAE as family medicine specialists, are offered guided self-help based on cognitive behavior therapy by PWPs, which can take a range of different formats. It can be over the phone, it can be online, it can be in person. If the person doesn't find that helpful after up to eight sessions, then they get stepped up to high intensity care what we would rec recognize as really standard psychological therapy uh, of between 16 or 20 sessions with a high intensity therapist. Throughout all the IAPT interventions, outcome measures are taken weekly to track the patient's progress and they're used in weekly supervision to reflect on whether the progress of the patient is on track. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what kind of training do psychological wellness practitioners uh, and high intensity workers actually get? Well, PWPs do a year's postgraduate certificate when they spend a day a week in the university and four days a week working in the mental health service under supervision. High intensity workers spend two days a week at university over two years and three days a week of supervised practice, and they gain a postgraduate diploma. If we compare this level of training to that of doctoral clinical psychologists in the UK, uh, clinical psychologists spend the same two days a week broadly at the university, um, and three days a week working in mental health services, but over a three year period in which they engage in a piece of doctoral level research. The most important thing I think though to highlight is that IAPT workers during their training are NHS employees. You can't access the training unless you already have an IAPT job. So there's an interconnectedness in, in the system, which I think has been incredibly helpful. 
So how are I up services doing? Well, they've succeeded in dramatically increasing the number of psychological therapists funded by the NHS and their outcome rates for the patients that they see are as good as those reported for CBT in randomized controlled trials. About 10 to 30% of referrals drop out before they see the eye up to worker. And this is something that research is now looking at to get a better understanding of the reasons why, um, but it's a problem. It needs investigating. 10% of the people referred have social needs that are better dealt with by social agencies and they get signposted to those agencies. About 30% of the GP referrals are complex presentations that require high intensity therapy rather than stepped care and their wait times are still an issue. And there's some evidence now that low intensity interventions can be detrimental for this group they can feel perhaps disempowered um, by being asked to go through something that isn't of help to them because it's just not intense enough for them. So IAPT provides a good model for how to train and support additional psychological therapists. Not everyone needs to be a clinical psychologist and have research training, but therapists do need a robust training and on the job supervision, if they're going to be competent to engage and intervene with a range of mental health difficulties. However, the number of people seeking out mental health services also reminds us that a simplistic individual approach to mental health is not enough. We aren't going to get rid of mental health problems simply by increasing an ever increasing number of therapists. We also need to look at systemic socialism issues and attitudes that perpetuate and maintain mental health difficulties. The obvious example, I think, is how the pandemic led to such a dramatic increase in the numbers of people with mental health problems. And there's some interesting work from the states looking at how these numbers decreased once vaccination programs became widely available, uh, once the sort of the hope of, of sort of rescue from the pandemic, that feeling of learnt helplessness passed. Another is a much smaller scale example from the UK. And I think we've heard other, other examples in the other presentations throughout the afternoon. Just thinking about the small scale example from the UK, one agency there gave out 10,000 leaflets in an area where mental health problems were growing. Now, Leaflets don't sound very 21st century, uh, but the people knew their community and they knew what got information across in that community. I think here we tend to use text messages. This leafleting occurred because working together, the local authority, the Citizens Advice Bureau and colleagues across the healthcare system identified an unusually high increase in mental health problems in the region of one town, Wokingham. So they promoted a new Citizens Advice Bureau service to residents there, where people could ring for advice, be signposted, for example, to their GP, to local food banks, to mental health services, employment or financial services. And at the time of reporting, 400 people had used that service who all reported improvements in their mental health status and that model is now going to be further rolled out. What's worth noting here, I think, is the ability of these different services to come together in a collaborative way at the local level. Notice something, that mental health problems were increasing, and coming up with a plan to do something about it, which was not increasing the number of therapists, but about prevention through social action. It sounds simple, but the collaboration and problem solving between agencies here, I think, is something to admire and something that we should strive to emulate. Abu Dhabi is making big strides, huge strides now in developing and beginning to implement its mental health plan and looking at interagency cooperation 
in relation to raising mental health awareness, thinking about how best to provide services, both within health services and the community. But this liaison at the local community level, leading to social action planning, I think remains one of our development challenges for the future. I believe we need to think further about how we tackle some of the issues that increase vulnerability and can underpin the development of so many of the mental health problems that we see in our clinics on a daily basis. Uh, this is a, a quote from the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who reminds us that there comes a point where we need to stop pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. I think that's really, really important for all of us to take on board who are operating mental health services. It's not quite always as simple as the Archbishop suggested. I think when we apply this principle of stopping people falling in the first place to mental health services, we're never gonna stop everyone falling in the river, but we can only try and reduce the number in partnership with other agencies. Psychiatrists and psychologists, even the Department of Health can't do it alone. We are all in this together and we need to work together to resolve these problems. Okay, turning back to our theme of increasing access to psychological therapies, another model that's being proposed, this time by the World Health Organization, is the MH gap model, the mental health gap model. The name itself goes back to our theme of demand outstripping supply. The gap referred to here is between supply and demand. The WHO has applied this model mainly in countries with very little in the way of mental health infrastructure. And it essentially relies on training primary care physicians and nurses to carry out an assessment of mental health problems and to provide psychosocial interventions. It's a model that's very familiar um, from work on community alcohol teams and community drug teams back in the 1980s in the UK, when we hoped that providing training and support to primary care workers would lead to them engaging to a greater extent in the treatment of problem drinkers by increasing their positive attitudes and their skills in doing so. I think it also echoes the first step of stepped care input provided by low intensity workers in, in IAPT. The model and its associated training very much stresses the importance of psychoeducation, helping the patient to reduce stress and strengthen social supports and promoting functioning in daily activities. These are crucial areas in which all primary care staff need training in how to deliver because they promote the patient's sense of agency and self-control. And it's the beginning of a process which should empower them to recognize that there is something that they can do about the difficulties that they're experiencing. Psychoeducation in particular is a really important area of development. And we heard from the speaker about old age psychiatry, um, about how often people aren't even told their diagnosis, let alone what to do about it. Helping people understand why they might have developed some of the symptoms that they're experiencing may enable them to begin problem solving about how to manage their symptoms themselves, which in itself will reduce the need for further intervention. So the MH GAP programme also trains primary care workers to deliver a range of guided self-help activities, structured support groups and other activities. It's less helpful as a model though, in addressing how we can increase the provision of skilled therapists, such as high intensity workers or psychologists or psychotherapists, people who can deliver more complex mental health interventions. As with IAPT, there's an emphasis throughout the training modules on the supervision of staff who are being trained to deliver these interventions. So in thinking about what direction perhaps we should go in, to improve the availability of psychological interventions, which MH, MH GAP trains primarily nurses to deliver, and which IAPT trains low intensity workers to deliver, we need to consider how much training and supervisory input is required and what we actually get for it. There's also the issue of how quickly we can start to bring some of these services online. 
The MH gap model talks about five days to train a nurse to deliver one group work package for dealing with mild depression, covering behavioral activation, relaxation, problem solving, and so on. It also notes that while they're engaging and delivering that package, they're going to require one hour supervision every week from a psychologist or a psychiatrist. And that this time has to be made available from their existing duties and ring fenced by their clinic manager. No new posts are being developed to cover that person's existing duties. And in addition to running the group, there's always gonna be a certain amount of administration required in terms of identifying participants, issuing invitations, answering careers, which all in itself takes time. In contrast to the IAPT model is that a low intensity trainee post must be fully funded before the person can commit, commence their day a week of training. And the four days a week that they work within the clinic, then they carry out a range of psychosocial interventions, which is their primary remit. I think it's important for us to remember at this stage that the integration of mental health provision into primary care is a process rather than something which occurs at a single point in time. If we're going to buy into a stepped care model, it's gonna take additional funding to establish substantive training posts in primary care clinics and the setting up of locally based training courses, which is not gonna happen straight away. We also need to consider how these training posts are licensed and how the PWPs who qualified from the training are licensed. How their input was paid for through the existing insurance system is also gonna to need to be examined as well as consideration given to setting up their supervisory system. Easier just to train a few nursing staff to run a few groups, hey? Um, yep. However, if we're looking for a sustainable system, then I'm not sure that this is the way forward. I don't think I'm the only person here who's participated in training courses for primary care staff, which although very appreciated by participants, have not led to substantive service developments, because what was being asked of the staff was to work outside their existing job roles with no long-term assurances of continuing time to do it. Getting supervision of new skills, both in terms of identifying supervisors and getting permission to attend sessions has always been a perennial problem for that kind of training. With strong organizational backing, these problems may be reduced, but in the long term, the unfunded commitment of extra resources is always hard to sustain. The most sensible way forward then, I would argue, is for a hybrid model that pilots training some staff in specific psychosocial interventions on top of the broader training required for the majority of primary care staff to ensure the identification of mental health problems is occurring, appropriate psychoeducation is happening and encouragement of patients to engage with simple self-help measures. While that's occurring, we should be engaging in setting up specific funded training posts for low intensity psychological well-being practitioners to deliver guided self-help using CBT techniques. So how do we meet the demand at the primary care level for more complex psychological interventions? At the moment, some people are being referred to psychologists employed by the primary care service. Do, do we have any in the room still? No, all gone? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, others are being referred out to the private sector. Shout out for the private sector. Yeah. Uh, but the majority of people who actually present to the private sector are actually self-referred. They're not referred by family, family physicians. And there's a significant demand, as we previously discussed. If the identification rate among family physicians increases, we're gonna see an even greater demand on the services. And I would suggest that the majority of people being picked up by the primary care physicians are also going to be Arabic, Hindu, Urdu speakers. Language is a huge issue for therapy services here because of the large number of nationalities who live here. Most private mental health clinics work in both English and Arabic, 
And the psychologists that they most want to recruit are Western trained and experienced and bilingual in Arabic and English. There's a shortage of Arabic speaking psychologists with training in CBT and other evidence-based therapies and experience of regular post-qualification supervision. And we need to try and remedy this by providing additional training opportunities. At the same time, we have well-trained CBT therapists and other psychotherapists who are not psychologists who could do the job, but are not eligible for HAD licenses therefore can't work in health facilities or get reimbursed by insurance companies. Looking at licensing requirements then may help us increase capacity while looking at funding and training issues. Increasing capacity in relation to the provision of clinical supervision is essential to maintaining quality services. Yet this is not always an argument that's gained much traction here in the past, partly in the private sector where providing regular clinical supervision comes at a significant commercial cost. This attitude is beginning to change, but by no means universally. Aside from commercial pressures, some psychologists who have not been socialized rigorously during their professional training to see supervision as a vital part of their continuing professional development can be resistant to the idea of having a regular reflective space. When we look at what clinical supervision is designed to do, however, it's hard in policy terms for this stance to be maintained. I think it's quite hard to argue with the importance of a practice that enhances professional competence, monitors quality and protects the public. Having supervision, however, is not a mandatory requirement for renewing licensure in the UAE. It's recognized as one strand of continuing medical education. Although supervision is always required when developing practice, I believe that there are significant advantages in making it a career long mandatory requirement, and particularly in doing so at a time when we're trying to enhance therapy capacity. Many psychologists here prefer the term case consultation to clinical supervision which they feel that their employers may see as meaning they're not really experienced enough to work independently, which is incredibly far from the truth. However, there are very significant differences between the two. Case consultation is initiated by the therapist. Uh, the supervisor, supervisor has not necessarily any obligation to report unsafe practice, the therapist needs to have sufficient insight or reflective capacity to recognize issues that need to be addressed and seek help. The more experienced the therapist, the less likely they are to recognize the need of a model of lifelong supervision under this kind of system. Clinical supervision, on the other hand, is around regular meetings, a supervision contract drawn up, making participants aware of their obligations to each other, and it's a long-term relationship with a more experienced colleague dedicated to helping the therapist develop and is a career long activity. Case consultation in itself does not guarantee either competence, quality or public protection. So if you want to increase the capacity of psychologists who can deliver complex and technical interventions, we need to focus on making licensing renewal contingent on receiving supervision and publicizing this to the private sector, ensuring the needed quality and quantity of supervision available through providing training courses and ultimately accreditation for supervisors, creating government sector training posts for high intensity therapists, for psychologists who are already eligible for licensing and the developing of associated training courses. And there's some interesting parallels with the UK here, which originally developed clinical psychology training programs because of a lack of capacity in the NHS. Um, but time precludes me going into that in any detail here today. And lastly, I think we need new types of license for mental health professionals already accredited and licensed in their own countries to bridge the gap while internal capacity is being developed. This is a attempt to, to bring what I've said together. 
you know, if we want to increase the capacity of psychologists who can deliver complex and technical interventions, we need to focus, I believe, on all these things here. There's already some work being done on this with training programs and some screening programs in place, but it's the beginning of a process. The type of person that the type of service that the person receives will be assessed and discussed with them at an initial triage meeting after referral. And then they'd be signposted to community-based support and or to services which provide counseling, that listening ear with a view to helping the person decide what they want um, and problem solve, or to basic skills training to improve resilience or to more intensive therapy. Some of the barriers to implementing this are highlighted in red, and I believe that what we need to be done is highlighted in blue. Okay, what I hope is that this presentation leads to a conversation on whether this is indeed a good way forward. It's my personal view on what a good way forward might look like. Others may have alternative visions. Um, I very much look forward to participating in some of those conversations, uh, either over the next couple of days or, or well after that. So thank you for listening.